fine and Jim Dandy. <laughs> so now we started the recording, Eric, and you were already talking. Hi, everybody. I'm Donna. I'm with Real Siblings. It ain't easy. And I'm Donna Reed in Tucson, Arizona. And I'm here with my brother. Eric Seaman, and I'm with Keller Williams in San Antonio, Texas. And we are here with our final podcast of 2022. And during these podcasts, we have been reminiscing and sharing about our young lives in Lindsay, Ohio, and growing up there, and then how it impacted our real estate careers in San Antonio, Texas, for Eric and myself in Tucson, Arizona. We have enjoyed this year sharing kind of the love and laughter that we had growing up, and also comparing and contrasting our times, our lives, our fun, our not so fun <laughs> to, <laughs> to where we live and work right now. And as we're wrapping up this last episode, um, we're hoping that you have enjoyed the time that you've spent with us and what you've listened and hopefully learned a little bit and that you will continue as we head into 2023. And um, with that, Eric, I think I'm going to give you the floor. And um, for those that are watching and or not watching, I guess, either way, uh, tell us about the photo behind you and then what's happening in San Antonio in Southern Texas during this season. All right. Well, thank you. And okay. So for everybody who's on YouTube, you can see a church setting behind me for everybody listening on podcast, going to do my best to explain what we're seeing. So in previous episodes, we've talked about uh, our church that we went to growing up. It was Trinity United Methodist Church. And every year it was decorated for the holidays. And there used to be an old Christmas card that was created that had a picture of that. Well, behind me is the 2022 version of Trinity United Methodist Church, as I say, all dressed up and decorated for the Christmas season. The altar is adorned with poinsettias. Uh, there's a Christmas tree, got a swing. Yep. For everybody who's on the video, uh, a Christmas tree <laughs> that is full of what they refer to as Christmons, which is a combination of two words, Christ and monograms, and they're typically gold and white. Uh, a lot of them were handmade 20, 30 years ago. I remember making some of those uh, all those years ago. Yep. Um, the purple and blue altar cloth, they're standing out, and you can see a couple of the stained glass windows in addition to what I'll say is the facade of the pipe organ uh, behind the choir loft because the actual functional pipes were hidden behind a wall and those were just the visual visual impact of there were way many more notes than the 10 pipes there that you can see uh, yeah. but all of it is just it's it's what we grew up with it's where we went to it's what we expected to see every year and in our most recent episode uh, where we discussed Christmas uh, with our guest Rachel Zimmerman Williams she mentioned uh, the church, so we wanted to put that out there. And then as we record, today is actually St. Stephen's Day or Boxing Day or December 26th, the day after Christmas, <laughs> depending on how you want to look at it. You know and, what, Eric, I, I want to interrupt real quick, too, and just say thank you to a couple of the people in Lindsay who sent that photo to us so that we had it, because we had asked if anybody had the photo. So Kay Okay, Eagle, so who sent it? You Kay sent Eagle. it to yeah, Kay Eagle sent it to me. Uh, Nancy Lipster posted it this morning, too. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so at our Christmas Eve service that I went to at our church, Great Oaks Fellowship, uh, we had finished our carol and candlelight service. It was typical, closed with silent night, candles on. We were a combination of real candles and little battery-operated candles yeah. for the kiddos, <laughs> as we discussed. And then after service, because it is such a tradition in San Antonio, outside the back end of the church was the food truck, which is uh, Alpha E Omega's uh, tamales. <laughs> and we wow. pre-ordered tamales, and you could have hot cocoa with marshmallows that the kids were providing while you waited in line to pick up your tamales. And we pre-ordered a, a dozen pork, a dozen chicken, and a dozen uh, bean and cheese, which is kind of unusual. Uh, wow. But for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, tamales are, I, I use the word sumptuous, uh, moist delights. They're corn husks. They're filled with a seasoned corn masa that then you put the filling inside, you wrap it all up in the corn husk and then put them in a steamer and season them. 
they're sold by the dozen. You don't even get uh, you can't a buy one. I mean, there's yeah. such a there's a place not far from our house um, that has a lineup. There was not only a line in front of the building of people who got out of their cars, but there was a lineup a quarter mile down the road with people trying to get through the drive through to pick up their tamales. It's okay, that much so. Eric, Caleb is here. He just walked in. So I'm going to let him pop in and say hi. And come on, you can. He was waiting um, my turn. He was waiting Let his in. turn. Ooh, he, that was mysterious. Your body kind of came and went. That was really Yeah, strange. it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is my youngest son. And for those of you that have listened to the podcast, um, Caleb is the one who recorded the intro. Adam is the one that recorded the song. And then Annabelle. Eric's granddaughter is the one that did the outro. Is that what you call yeah, it? Yeah, that we're, we're calling it the outro is the, the, is the way I have it. The, the so intro and outro. But we specifically asked Caleb uh, to do that because Caleb is actually a paid professional, not full time, but as an actor uh, in the Denver area and has had several leading roles and done a couple of commercials. It's like, look, let's put some professionalism around this instead of this old bearded man just winging it <laughs> a alleged professionalism <laughs> <laughs> although we have to say for those of you that have listened um he was very quick to critique us during the first few now i don't know if he even listens to all of them eric but you know he was quick to say you know if you're going to do this you should do this and if you right you yeah. know give, giving us advice so anyway we just wanted to introduce caleb because he's here and and he went rock climbing this morning. So for those of you that are freezing in the Midwest and, you know, have been dealing with snow and 10 below, that is not what it is in it's, Arizona. It's too hot in Tucson. <laughs> too, too darn hot, right? What are you, you guys 70 today? We got up to 62, I think. Yeah, 70, but exercising in the sun in the desert, it felt like 90, like it's pretty <laughs> hot, so... Yeah. So I think now he wants to nap, but we asked him to say hi. So And, and he in. has to nap before they go out to sing karaoke tonight. <laughs> yeah, right. Important things. Thanks, Caleb. <laughs> um, okay. So while I wrap up, and I talked about the tamales there, but you also have to know that it, this is such a thing that actually San Antonio holds the Guinness World Record for the most tamales ever made in a 12-hour time frame. In 2011, 1,300, 1,300 people used almost a kilogram uh, uh wow i don't want to say kilogram that's not the oh. right thing a, th a thousand kilograms a kilo kilo a, a thousand kilos of product to make seventeen thousand tamales in 12 hours and okay, it's a so certified guinness world record and it's been there in place since 2011. all right so you've said tamales we always have said tamales and now and now like that E's not being pronounced. What's up with that? When, you know, because what I grew up with and what I still hear, I hear the E being pronounced. Tamales. I, you know, it's one of those that you, it depends on where you're at and how they okay. pronounce it. it okay. is, it's becoming more and more common to just say tamales. Okay. In San Antonio. And, and, and I've yours, been here 30 years and it used to be tamales, but. Okay. So do yours, do the ones that you buy there, do they have an olive in them? No. So a lot of the ones I Jose brought some to our Christmas party um, a couple weeks ago, and they all have an olive in it. And I don't know the significance of that because it's like one olive. So it reminds me, it makes me think about king cakes or something. Is there some reason that there's one olive in in one? I'll to, we're going to have to look that up. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's got to be more research because I do not think olives were native to Central America where the tamales no. originally came from. So that's something that came later. However, yeah. I did hear that in a conversation I had yesterday for someone who is in Florida making tamales yeah. and they're using the more traditional in Central America. They were originally made with bananas, leaves, not right. corn husk, and they were making them with bananas because you can get the leaves down in Florida. Yeah. And they so, were putting the olive in. Okay. So the tradition of the tamales or tamales, you know, well, it, maybe it'll be interesting to see what listeners think about the use of those words. And That's our Christmas them. present. That's our <laughs> and and so um, beyond beyond that piece because here we are the day after that that's a food thing right and that happens both where you are and where I am and it yes. it starts a week or two before and people are taking orders the whole month and um, and stuff like that 
So we also, the, the image behind me, for those of you that are watching, um, are luminarias. And I think that a few people had even used them some at home in Ohio before I left. It was a tradition that it expanded. And the picture that, that I have behind me is in black and white. And um, you can kind of see part of a saguaro cactus there. But like, like all of these episodes, I did a little bit of research because to me, it was always just Southwest Santa Fe. That's where it came from without knowing the, the, the history right. of it. And um, I've read two or three places now where they were originally bonfires that had uh, pinion boughs and they were arranged in like three foot high, like big, big burning fire pits, you know, and that they lit. And some people say in history that they lit the way for Mary and Joseph in their search for lodging in Bethlehem. Um, they're also linked to uh, the ancient tradition of creating and uh, delivering warnings. So when you think, you know, we hear all these things about fires and sending messages by fires, they're linked to that. Um, and then uh, I. So that's where J.R.R. Tolkien got the idea in. Yes. Lord, yeah, what Lord that, of the Rings that, or the Hobbit. fires on the mountain sending the <laughs> signal across the I'm sure that's what it was. Yeah. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting, especially with you having a, a wife from Louisiana, is that some of them there say that the fires and the bonfires were lit along the Mississippi River so that uh Papa or Père Noel could find his way through the thick fog and everything to bring presents to the kids. So what I here in the Southwest have thought of as just, okay, Pueblo Indians, New Mexico, customs that came from Spain. And in Spain, they called them um, farolitos or little lanterns, which makes sense. And they were yep. bags or whatever with um, with sand and real candles. And of course, like everything else, these right now that you see in this picture could very well be a light bulb in a, in a bag that won't burn, you know, but um it's it's kind of a fascinating thing to think about light guiding the way, especially as you and I are both churchgoers and we've just been through Advent and talked about the light of Christ. And, you know, I'm not here yep. to preach to anybody, but the, you know, if you think about being in a cave, black, 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 dark, 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 and then you write light, one light, Right. So um, it's it's kind of cool that these lights have a significance. Yeah, and so when they were cultures. being transitioned, we started using them up in Ohio and Michigan in that area. The challenge was is that it's like, oh, just take a brown paper bag, put some sand in it, and put a candle in it. Well, you've got snow, you've got slush, you've got moisture, you've got yeah. uh, a burning bag and blowing winds and trying <laughs> to keep a candle lit and everything. I think the climate in the Southwest is much more conducive to yeah. so uh, Luminaria. I mean, even when I moved here, one of the neighborhoods that I lived in, everybody saved their milk jugs and yeah. you used milk jugs and turned them into Luminarias. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and what's interesting for me, um, aside from whatever traditions we had related to our families or in the church when we were kids and what happened then, is, you know, life evolves and, and things change. Decorations change. People here put light bulbs all the way up those saguaro cactuses. I don't even know how they do that. And when we think it's going to freeze, people put Santa Claus hats on the tops of all of the different arms of some of the cactus. Of the cactuses. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you know, and the good <laughs> news is the thorns keep the hats from blowing off. So, well, <laughs> and you know, at some point, I think even peanuts work that in because Snoopy's oh. cousin Spike lived in the desert and they decorate the Swaro cactuses. <laughs> you remember the weirdest stuff. I know. As Jeannie always says, it's like, look at the size of your head. It's yeah. got room to store all this worthless information and tidbits. Yeah. I need to have you on one of my trivia nights sometime and see how. So see we how were out the other day and we ran into a restaurant and while we were eating, they started trivia. And we uh -huh. had no idea they were going to do a trivia game and we just were there. Well, it, it turns out it's Christmas trivia. And let's okay. just say I have an unfair advantage. Yeah. I was I was not playing, but going around to tables and giving everybody their answers. <laughs> and well, it's like, wait, how do you spell that? No. 
it's a good way for Santa to be helpful. That's, that's yes. awesome. And I and the reason I had to say St. Stephen's Day specifically earlier is because that was one of the questions and I blew it. I got that one wrong, but that was one uh, out of 13 that I missed by the time we had left. <laughs> so so in San Antonio, um, what happens like down on the river walk in the middle of town or around the Alamo? Are there specific traditions or things that happen that there there are the very city. definitely so alamo plaza has a christmas tree that's provided the main grocery store that actually started in kerrville texas which is a little bit further north and west from where i currently live but is headquartered now in san antonio texas uh provides the christmas tree okay which is alamo plaza gets one similar to like rockefeller center does there is a christmas tree lighting the day after uh thanksgiving and that's the official start of the season season but the san antonio river walk which is one of the main tourist attractions in all of texas is right. lit up uh the banks of the river are surrounded or yeah I'll, I'll stick with surrounded with these trees called a bald cypress trees and they're oh. monsters they are easily 50 60 foot tall and they are draped with Twinkling, blinkling, blinking lights, blinkling, blinkling, blinkling yeah. lights all up and down the river. And as the city has developed, especially in the last, I'll even say five years, there have been extensions to the river walk, which have become more elaborately decorated. And you can take one of the riverboat cruises and just cascade down the river with the lights blinking overhead. There's so, a big event that's held at the Arnson River Theater, and there's a river parade that goes on. San Antonio at the holidays is really, really, really all in. So, Eric, at the at the Riverwalk, there's the upper part, and then there's the lower part. So, right. are those trees down at the lower part? The going trees are on the lower level, okay. directly next to the banks of the river. That's okay. I, you know, I've and as there, a cypress tree, heard. it's it's not it's a conifer coniferous tree okay it's not okay leaving. i do the emphasis different there i say conifer is it a conifer conifer yeah i think no it's, okay. if, if you're if you're it's coniferous or conifer <laughs> if you're doing a thing <laughs> if, if, if the trees don't have a date they're just single there then it's a conifer <laughs> so there there's that there is a holiday river parade uh, mm. which includes floats and performances and groups from around the city on That's boats neat. through the city. Uh, and this year I got to participate a little bit. Uh, one of the tra San Antonio traditions and draws is a museum saloon restaurant called the Buckhorn Museum. Yep. And on uh, December 11th, Western Winter Wonderland, I got to introduce my version of a cowboy Western Santa and was down there greeting uh, people and patrons and individuals and had a ball. Uh, look forward to growing that in the in the years ahead. And we'll be looking for a Longhorn because we're talking about Santa coming in, riding a Longhorn. So for real, for real, for real. Well, that's all. It, it would be stopping the traffic in the street so that Santa can come down and get off at the Buckhorn. And so yeah, it's it, we're we're hopefully developing that and it's going to I'm be already worried thing. about it and you're just talking about it I know and more. and but okay so you know that I do farm and ranch and one of yeah. the most recent connections that I've made uh not in the longhorn industry but I am now linked with the Texas Bison Association and okay. because not only am I a real estate agent but my original degree in uh school with yeah. college was a bachelor of science degree in zoology I am now a volunteer for helping with the bison vaccinations. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm telling you, I am psyched about getting out and getting hands on right next to some of the those animals. In, oh, my uh, Lord. So those of you that are looking for homes that either have longhorns or bison, Eric might be your guy. I, don't know. I can help you out. <laughs> it could, it could, it could hook you up with that. So, OK, so I was as you were talking about the, the river walk, which immediately pops into my head, I was um, and then and then you had that whole German area north of the city, you know, the, No, it's actually just south of the city. Oh, King William District is south of the city, and okay. that's where the German settlers were originally at. And it is it's. The historic, it's one of the oldest historic districts in the country, officially yeah. designated as a historic district. 
it is there there are houses that open their doors and do tours during the holidays so you can go in and see how their uh 19th century victorian stoneware are all just decorated and highlighted and it's it's pretty amazing there's a lot to do down there during there, that and, there and a is. lot of there's, diversity uh, you know in, to think about that word university decorates and they put up over a million lights in their trees wow, around the cool. campus uh, the San Antonio Botanical Gardens has now started a program where the, I can't even imagine. I mean, we're not getting there this year, uh, but we do plan on putting that on the schedule for next year because archways and drapes and lighted blue bonnet field. They've made lights in the shape of blue bonnets to do a giant lighted blue bonnet Good field Lord. as you go through it. Yeah, it's it's really something to see. Uh, so the zoo gets involved. It's It's all over. Sea World so Fiesta Texas Tucson I, I, you know as you're talking about that I was thinking about Tucson so we have an area called Winter Haven which is different than any other part of town and um I know you were here at least once around the holidays you know yeah. but um but maybe Thanksgiving I can't remember if you've been here at Christmas but Winter Haven is a part of town that they have um their own wells and when you buy the main avenue turning in is Christmas Avenue when you buy a house in Winter Haven, you have to know that you have to decorate for the holidays. There are <laughs> oh, yeah. And, it's and an HOA requirement. It's an HOA requirement. And then they <laughs> they block off the street. So Caleb and I came by the other night and it was um, Christmas Eve night, I guess. I don't know. And, and I thought, oh, I wonder if they're still open, thinking maybe they're not. Tons of people, and you can rent um, the carts that you pedal through and and drink. And there's one day where you can, or two where you can take cars, but mostly it's walking. And everybody in there, they are so creative with what they do. But when you buy there, you have to know that this is going to happen. And um, you know, people go through on wagons and stuff. But again, because of our temperature. It can be chilly. You can be cold. Right. Desert bands. desert winter. Winter in yeah, the desert yeah. is nighttime, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but but bands play. Our piano player from church is one of his band. They're called Desert Chameleon. They always play and and stuff. And so that's a, a tradition that I've been to a few times. And then um the other one is is that old Tucson, the movie set slash historic area, has started redoing some things. So they had their uh, saloon and their gunfight shows and all that. Now, I don't know how you work Christmas into all of those things, but, you know, maybe, maybe the dancers in the bar just have red dresses or something. And I'm not sure about Santa in a gunfight and all of that, but they have gotten to where they have reopened and they well there's been a couple of recent holiday movies including this year violent night which has got a little bit of uh oh, or or, I, I or last like year's to... fat man uh <laughs> yeah i would like to think that if you're um out taking your family out that that's not that's not although they have the creepy things the halloween things you know so. that's right but, that's right okay you know, every... so i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah. transition this a little bit yeah. because we need to wind christmas down but you have made a standing tradition for New Year's. Yeah, I, I have. And this is this is my last year. So I have participated for the last 10 to 15 years. I don't even know how many in a jazz event out at uh, the Marriott Resort that's on the west side in the Tucson Mountains um, Star Pass Resort. And a friend of mine um, became acquainted with the, the lead musician. They partnered up. And so it's smooth jazz and it went from one night, not a big deal to two nights to then both nights being kind of big. And then there's a golf tournament for the autism society <laughs> this year. There's a singles meetup, but from what I understand, it's um, supposedly all just supposed to be trivia and stuff about music. It's not a dating thing. So we're going to see what that's like. Um, anyway, uh, that is, that's on new year's eve morning for, for so, so that's that's a tradition and we'll be sitting here hibernating at home maybe watching san antonio's downtown event and san antonio has a huge downtown event it's just that it's so big i don't want to fight with the crowds i don't want right. to fight with the traffic i don't want to fight with the drunks because yeah. we're talking easily fifty thousand people who will be yeah. downtown yeah. San Antonio around Hemisphere Park, which is where the 1968 World's Fair was held, uh, the Tower of Americas, 
the local TV stations broadcast through the Fairmont Hotel, which is another story somewhere down the line. It was picked up in mass and moved from its original location to an, a hotel picked up and moved a brick hotel pick up and move. Um, they broadcast from there a couple years ago. Uh, we San Antonio for all the diversity in music typically brings in uh, a classic That's, rock kind really? of group. Uh, wow. A couple years ago for the big celebration, uh, Pat Benatar, Neil Geraldo, her husband. So were, I thought it'd be like mariachis and, or something. You know, I, like, there are <laughs> definitely some of that going on. There's, a, but the the Cajunto and Tejano festival is later in the spring, closer okay. to Fiesta. So we'll talk about that then. And I wow. think we better wrap things up because we. Well, can on I think it, oh, I think it's important that we talk about going into 2023 and the fact that this is our last uh, one of the year. And as we go into 2023, we're going to talk about um, we're going to have a guest again and we're going to talk about uh, projections in real estate for 2023 and our personal goals and what we see happening in the housing market. We have spent October, November and December a lot on lifestyle and a little bit less on the market. So um, I, I, I believe that our intent is in January to get a little bit more emphatic, right? In that in that arena. At there least we go. January. Emphatic. Good word, sis. Okay, is that no. word? <laughs> emphatic three syllables. <laughs> yeah, we, we do. I mean, our goal on this, again, we're reminiscing, but we want to convey and create relationships. And in real estate, and I know you've heard this, uh, they got to, and it's really true in any kind of sales position, business position, they got to know you, they got to like you, and they got to trust you. And yeah. knowing us and liking us are kind of what we're trying to do with this podcast to get ourselves out there so that people know who we are, feel like this is somebody that have similar uh, emotional connections to create some sort of tie. Right. And it's up to us then once we have that meeting to create the trust. Mm -hmm. And so know and like, that's what I think we've been focused on. And now we really want to start demonstrating our expertise as we move into 2023 and season number two. <laughs> short, of, short of just talking about all of our great memories that we may or may not remember the same, that's right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that we've re remember and the ones we've made up. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So we'll let you we'll let you wrap us up, Eric. <laughs> All right. So again, as we close out uh, today's episode and our 2022 season, uh, season number one, we want to thank everybody for listening as we've strolled down memory lane and reminisced once again about our life in Lindsay, Ohio, and how it's impacted our lives and careers in real estate in San Antonio, Texas, and in Tucson, Arizona. If you are in either of those areas and are looking for a real estate agent, both Donna and myself are available. We work with Keller Williams and are happy to be of assistance. And if you are listening somewhere around the country or around the globe, please remember that we are connected to an extensive network of professionals around the globe. And we would be happy to connect you so that you can find a property to call home and create lasting memories. And until 2023, remember, <laughs> it may be simple, ain't always easy. And I'm Eric. And I'm Donna. And, and we, we are, are Real siblings. siblings. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Thanks, Eric. <laughs>